It's really brilliant to have recently elected TDs, um, both members of the Irish SWP. Um, sorry. Breed Smith, uh, recently elected um, as a TD to Dublin, and uh, Richard Boy Barrett, who's been a TD for Dun Leary for the past five years. Um, they'll both speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up and have plenty of time for discussion and debate. Um, so without further ado, um, Breed. Okay, comrades, um, delighted to be here, and I'm having, I must say, a very interesting Markson because we are indeed living in a very rapidly changing world, and being here to be able to analyse it and to uh, decide and debate and discuss how we handle it is, is very important. Uh, I think that teacher needs a rest. She's, get, she's sharing too many meetings. Um, but um, uh, I did just the title of the meeting, Ireland's New Politics, it's gas because when we got elected, it, we got elected into a very new situation in, in Dáil Éireann. Um, Sinn Féin have a big block of um, opposition TDs, but not as big as they had hoped. They only got 14% of the vote, and in the lead-up to the election, they were sometimes at 19, 20, 21% in the polls. So they suffered a bit of a, uh, a back, you know, blowback from their point of view. But the Dáil is indeed very diverse. There's um, um, a, a plethora of different TDs who have amassed into independent groupings, one of them uh, quite a left-wing grouping called the Independence for Change. There's the Sinn Féin grouping, there's ourselves in the Anti-Austerity Alliance People Before Profit grouping, and then there's other odds and sods, some very strange odds and sods, like two brothers from Kerry who are worth a fortune and wear funny hats and speak in very strange voices. Um, <laughs> hardly anyone can understand them. Um, they give out about the water movement and the water charges, and one of them is, is becoming very wealthy on the backs of putting in water meters all over Kerry. So these are very strange creatures altogether, but they got a huge amount of support in uh, Kerry, unfortunately. Um, so it's, it's quite a mixed all, and indeed this title of this meeting, The New Politics, is exactly what the establishment and Dáil Éireann wanted to talk about, was this is the new politics, we're all in it together, we can listen to each other, we can compromise, it's a new era. So they do mad things like they uh, get a very left-wing woman called Claire Daly, who used to be in the Socialist Party, to introduce the order of business. Um, they, uh, thankfully, from our point of view, we have loads more speaking time, which is one of the reasons, I'll come back to it later on if I get time, if I don't, maybe Richard will, why we made this arrangement with the Socialist Party Anti-Austerity Alliance, because it allows us to have more speaking time, more exposure, more ability to put in bills and to make a difference. Um, but they're talking about the new politics and talking about the new dial as if this was something wonderful to be embraced by the likes of Enda Kenny, Michal Martin, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, and indeed the traitors uh, that are in the Labour Party, who, by the way, were absolutely decimated in the election. They end up with just one TD more than we have. So the Labour Party have had a real kick in the face uh, and rightly deserved because they've been nothing but traitors to the Irish working class. But this week showed you what that real uh, new politics actually means. And two of the issues, or three of the issues, I'll just touch on quickly that showed it. One was Brexit. It had a profound impact and is having a profound impact on the Irish ruling class. And you may have noticed during the campaign, the boss of Ryanair, former heads of banks, the, T the Taoiseach himself, many TDs, the ambassador here in London, all lined up to get the Irish diaspora to, to support a, a, a leave vote. Um, and it says, every sorry, Jesus, I need a rest, a remain vote. Uh, and it says everything about what, how you should vote if uh, the boss of Ryanair is coming over to tell you to do one thing and of course you would do the other, wouldn't you? I would anyway. Um, um, and this has had a profound impact on the dial. And so the debate all week has been, you know, they've allowed a few hours of debate about Brexit, but their position is to eulogise the European Union, to tell everybody that the sky will fall in on your, our heads, that we absolutely need Europe, that these are the best things since the sliced pan, having put people through the experience of the most vicious 
68 billion uh, euros worth of bailouts that took, um, as the Minister for Finance called it, that picked the low-hanging fruit, that took money from the disabled, from children's education, from pensioners, from allowances to fuel, to rent allowances to the poor, that took money from travellers, that took money from immigrants, that closed down shelters for women's aid for, for, for uh, people suffering from domestic violence, that took money from the Rape Crisis Centre, that used the sort of most vulnerable in society to bail out the very wealthiest in the European banks uh, and the British banks indeed, but the very, very wealthiest people are benefiting at the pain and the suffering of the uh, ordinary decent people right across Ireland. Um, and and the, the, all they can do is get up and eulogise this uh, to the Irish public. Uh, but the Irish public, and particularly those who were involved in the fantastic water campaign, are delighted. People are delighted with the result. And as Mary was telling me the other day, uh, a working class bus driver in her branch, when she asked him, he's only a new comrade, you wouldn't expect him to be very sophisticated about our politics. But when she asked him what he thought of Brexit, he wasn't at all surprised. He said, this is, this is obviously a vote of uh, protest from the people who've been left behind, who've been told to feck off, you don't matter. You, nobody is surprised that the British working class have responded in the way that they have. So that's one of the issues this week that talks about the new, that tells you a lot about the new politics. And the other, of course, is the question of housing, um, the, the bailout for the builders and the developers. And people may be familiar or not with, an, with a, a, a structure called NAMA, the National Assets Management Agency, that was set up by Fianna Fáil in the previous government that took on all the toxic debts of the property during the property boom and was then to, you know, sell it off and make money. But it also had a social clause in it. It has has been selling off tranches and tranches of Irish property for a song to uh, uh, companies from Canada, to, um, so, you know, these, these, what do they call them? Vulture. Vulture funds. Thanks, Richard. I really am tired. Vulture funds, REITs and other organisations that are specifically established to get rid of uh, the, the, the toxic debts of the Irish property developers and to assist them to re-emerge. And they are re-emerging, but they're not re-emerging to build the tens of thousands of houses that are needed by the 120,000 people on a waiting list, families on a waiting list, the 2,000 children who are homeless in Dublin every night, and that's only the children. Uh, instead, the money that the developers have regained from the bailout is being used to build luxury homes on Hoth Head and in, in very posh parts of South Dublin. And people see through this. And during the week, there's a criminal investigation into this organisation, NAMA. There was a bill put before the Dáil to uh, extend this investigation from the north to the south. And the, all of the government parties and the Labour Party and some of the independents lined up in the new politics to say no to this. So where is the new politics when it comes to defending, uh, to fighting corruption and defending the rights of people uh, to a home? The austerity is continuing. And in fact, during the week after the Brexit vote, the European Union told the Irish people, you're not getting away with not paying water charges. We will come after your ass and sue you unless you implement water charges. So this is the very kind, uh, decent, progressive, uh, all-inclusive Europe that we're all being asked to, to, to eulogise and, uh, and stay within. And, and it is going to, um, it's a slap in the face, of course, to the to the people who've campaigned and who voted for over 90, there's over 90 TDs in the Dáil now, who got elected specifically on a commitment to abolish water charges and abolish Irish water and lots of other austerity measures. So it's a slap in the face to the people who put them there, uh, that they're saying nothing about it. It's a slap in the face to the people uh, who stood out on the streets to block the wheat metering companies from putting meters in, in, into, their, into their homes. And it's a slap in the face for those who went out and voted and campaigned in the, in the elections to make sure that the water charges were the issue on the agenda. Um, I'm, I'm going to let Richard talk a bit about the the actual campaign itself, but suffice it to say that in every town, street, city, parish, um, you know, townland, and, and bigger and smaller towns from Dun Donegal to Dingle and from Galway to Dublin, the water movement was amazing. Everybody got out and fought the metering. Everybody got out and had local marches. And time and time again, and Richard and I were involved in the organising of bringing the, the Right to Water campaign together as a united front of unions, politics and communities, um, 
time and time again, despite our expectations, our expectations were you know, beaten by the numbers that turned out time and time again. Uh, the, the, the people of Ireland expressed their desire to fight. And so, Jordan, the whole business of austerity, when the Greeks were having their next general strike and their next general strike and their next general strike and loads of riots, we were being told that our oh, user, the good boys and girls of Europe, is don't fight and that's the way we need it because if you don't fight, you'll eventually come out of this and uh, we'll, we'll pay you back. But of course, the Irish did fight and it wasn't just on the question of water, but the question of water was the straw that broke the camel's back. People saw this most precious natural resource as being something that they were going to have to pay an arm and a leg for, and that would, because of that, would eventually uh, be privatised and be owned like other natural resources are by global companies. Um, and, and, and then this was an opportunity for them to do something, something they could actually do, like stand on the street, bring out your plastic chair and knit over your water meter to stop the, uh, the, the, the companies getting, getting in your way. It was fantastic. All the women used to get out knitting and having the crack and making tea and sit there in their plastic chairs and, I'm not moving. You're not going to make me move. Um, and, and also, they could boycott, and that was crucial. The boycott, the element that said we, we are not paying, was a, a, a very important element, but nothing was important as important as the demonstrations and nothing really frightened the establishment like the demonstrations. Uh, so I think that for us that's a very important lesson and when we go back on Monday we're meeting with the Right to Water campaign to uh, decide a response of another big demonstration to the threats from the European Union. So that will be uh, very important that we get back on the streets. Just a word to say about, you know, Lennon talked about standing on a dung heap. Well I can tell you it is full of shite, I'm telling you. <laughs> And I don't, uh, I don't know how Richard Boy Barrett did it as Billy No Mates for five years, really. It, was, it, it must have been a tough call because um, we have now three of us in there with a staff uh, working, you know, comrades supporting us and deciding how we do it and what we do it. So it's a hell of a lot easier, I'm sure, than it was for Richard, but it's, it's still extraordinarily difficult to deal with all the demands that are put in front of you. Nevertheless, it's important that we're there, and it's important that we're there not, to, um, not just to pass bills and to pass motions and to be, participate in debates, but to give people hope. And I think that's a big part of it, is that the movement on the outside needs the voice on the inside to give it hope and to give it expression and to give it continuity because we do live in uh, we, we don't live in new politics in the Dáil we certainly don't live in new politics in Europe we live in a world of, of bullying uh, in, in a world of threats in a world of very sinister um, agendas to enrich the most powerful at the expense of the most vulnerable and, and the least powerful so us being there is a source of hope uh, the day before, the day I came away actually to come to Marxism, we had a bill in front of the Dáil. It's called emergency legislation um, for to provide the government with ways and means of cutting public sector pay. It's been in existence since 2009 when the crash happened. They keep telling us we're in recovery. There's no emergency on, but they renewed that legislation on Thursday before we came away, and we had we threw all our toys out of the pram, kicked up mortar tore up the bill and they had to suspend the doll because of our, our eruptions uh, on behalf of public sector workers. And finally, because they're not here, I think it's hugely important to say a word about the success of our comrades in Northern Ireland in getting Jerry Carroll, who topped the poll in West Belfast, an absolutely stunning performance by the comrades in West Belfast. He got the second highest vote in Northern Ireland. And then, after all his life campaigning and being one of the best orators in the world and the best left winger that we've ever known, Eamon McCann got elected in file. So that was really, really... Uh And I don't know if any of you watch social media, but Eamon's performance is something to watch in, in Stormont. And the hands are going, and he's given it loads. And, and he has, I, I don't know whether he has the unionist terrified or not half the time, but it's, it's, it's having a great impact. And it's very important, again, to give people hope and to give expression and voice uh, to the anti-austerity message out there. Because, as we know, the, uh, the, the carnival of reaction that James Connolly talked about uh, after partition has really 
damaged uh, Ireland and partition is still a reality and the divisions and the sectarianism between the unionists and the, the, the nationalists is still a reality. Those guys had to walk into Stormont and I think we're probably the first MLAs to sign up, not as unionists, not as nationalists, but socialists. The first two that signed into the uh, Stormont regime. And it's extremely important that they had a victory of this magnitude that complements the victory of people before profit in the South because it cuts across the nonsense that you can't have an all-Ireland party that fights for an all-Ireland socialist agenda, that fights to get a, a true and genuine workers' republic that you know, ends the sectarian nature of the state, both north and south, and creates a workers-based uh, workers socialist republic. And it also uh, cuts through the nonsense that Protestant and Catholic workers have to remain divided forever because people may know that Jerry Carroll... Uh, Shankill Road is part of his constituency and he canvassed strongly on the Shankill Road and since the election he's held meetings on the Shankill against austerity the most recent one he had 50 people from the Shankill Road at a meeting there about a week ago that's a historic breakthrough for the left in Northern Ireland And I can't fail to mention, uh, people may not know her, um, Fiona, Fiona uh, Ferguson, a young woman from um, Ardoyne who ran in North Belfast. Now, North Belfast is one of the most divided communities. You can see the peace wall running down through it, and it's where you had flashpoints of, uh, you know, uh, unionists trying to stop, or, or hardened loyalists, I should say, trying to stop Catholic children going to school a number of years ago. She did ex extraordinarily well, uh, getting a first preference vote of 1,300. Uh, in this very divided community. So hats off to them. And on the anniversary of the 1916 Rising, I think it has been really encouraging for everybody. We have a very big challenge to keep going and to beat back austerity and to beat back this so-called new politics. We have a very big challenge to end sectarianism in the North, but I think we're in with a great chance. Right, thank you, Breed. Our next speaker is Richard Boyd Barrett. Yeah, well, it, it, is, uh, it is really a good news story, uh, what's happening in, in Ireland at the moment. Uh, I think the best compliment and tribute uh, I've heard in, in recent times uh, came from uh, Michael O'Leary, who was mentioned, who is the... Uh, tooth and claw capitalist boss of Ryanair, uh, scab air as I call them, um, uh, anti-union, uh, you know, vicious neoliberal, uh, stinking rich, uh, has general contempt for anything that is, is even remotely left uh, wing. And uh, he said there, he had, there was an extended interview uh, with him on one of the national uh, radio stations in the last week or so, where he particularly singled out and repeatedly mentioned people before profit as these crazy people uh, whose economics could ruin the country. Uh, and that's a fantastic compliment. Uh, uh, and uh, it shows they're threatened. Uh, and that, that is the place that we have come to from people who... Uh, whose general response to the radical and revolutionary left was to pretend they didn't exist, uh, ignore everything they said, uh, uh, fail to acknowledge their role or their ideas in any movements that did uh, develop in Irish society, try and distort what we said, we are now in a position where they simply can't ignore us. Uh, and that is a very good place to be, and even when they try and distort our message, we now have a platform to get our message out uh, as it is. Uh, and this is a real, real problem for them, um, which they have not come to terms with. I mean, my take on the new politics is that they are reeling. The political establishment in Ireland are reeling at what has happened over the last two years, most importantly based on the mass movement of resistance that Breed was talking about, 
which was absolutely unprecedented in scale and was the biggest mass movement, bar none, since the revolutionary period of 1918 to 1921. Uh, that was the scale of it. Uh, I mean, to have, as we did on uh, the biggest day of protest, uh, 250 to 300, we don't even really have a final count, uh, 1,000 people on the street in a country of just over 4 million uh, gives you an idea of what's happening. I think the British equivalent would be 6 million people on the street. Uh, so this is an enormous, enormous mobilization, and they were terrified, are terrified uh, by it. And it was that movement and the fact that we were an organic part of it had played leadership roles in it, in pulling it uh, together, uh, and stuck with that movement as it faced the wrath of the media, the political establishment, the use of police violence and bullying, the arrest of protesters, all of that stuff uh, uh, that that movement uh, has now prevailed. It uh, lifted, uh, doubled our numbers in the Parliament in terms of people for profit and the anti-austerity alliance. Beyond us, there are another six who would be either from the Trotskyist or radical or re revolutionary left, the so 12 people associated with that movement now elected in the Parliament, which is just under 10% of the Parliament. Uh, lifted uh, into the Parliament on, on the back of that and giving uh, voice to that movement, s such that the pressure of that forced first Sinn Féin, who wobbled on the issue and refused to support the civil disobedience campaign of boycott, saying in the first weeks of the campaign, Gerry Adams coming out and saying, I'm going to pay my water charges, I don't like them, but I'm going to pay them, but were forced within weeks to backtrack. Such was the scale of the movement and such was the scale of the boycott uh, that we uh, and, and the anti-austerity alliance advocated and which was taking off spontaneously uh, in uh, any event, uh, forcing Sinn Féin uh, to give clear commitments uh, to get rid of it. And then, of course, then the issue was, well, is it a commitment to get rid of it? Is it a red line commitment? And then it wasn't a red line commitment. Uh, and then it was a red line commitment because uh, the movement uh, escalated. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then, finally, forcing Fianna Fáil, who were in opposition but had been the governing party in the period 2008 to 2011 and had initially signed the agreement with the Troika and included in the memor of a Memorandum of Understanding to introduce these charges, finally, uh, a few months uh, before the election, they also, under the pressure of this mass movement, which was absolutely irresistible for them, had to give the commitment that they too would scrap water charges. Now, needless to say, uh, the slithery, dishonest uh, people, uh, as soon as the Parliament was convened, started to try and backtrack on that. Uh, it became suspension rather than abolition. Nonetheless, it is an enormous victory that these people, because they are now in a government, Fine Gael, are now in a much diminished minority government position with the support of Fianna Fáil, who are also much di diminished from their historic heights as the dominant party in the Irish state, have had to suspend this week or begin the, le the, the legislation which will suspend uh, the water charges. And in the same week, uh, the, uh, the, an attempt by... Um, private waste companies who we had fought in a previous battle against the introduction of waste charges uh, as a prelude to the privatization of waste services, attempted, as we had predicted 10 or 15 years before, would at some point just ratchet up and uh, massively ratchet up the cost of these charges, did exactly that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think the increases were up to, <clears throat> in some cases, 300% increases by these uh, private waste companies. But within a few days of them threatening this, spontaneous protests breaking out, organised by Breed, uh, Gino Kenny, our other elected TD, Breed raised the issue in the Dáil, and uh, within, I think, approximately a week, wasn't it, Breed, uh, the government uh, moved in and said, we're going to stop it. We're going, to say, we're, we're going to suspend it. They're not allowed. There's going to be a freeze. They can't introduce uh, these in increases. And the Minister for the Environment, who did this, uh, explicitly said, we have to do this, 
otherwise there's, there's going to be another water revolt. Uh, absolutely clear. And that was the debate, and it was fully understood. That's what they were afraid of, and they had to capitulate. Uh, and so it's been batted off to a commission, but the thing is frozen. I mentioned at the earlier meeting, I mean, one of the biggest issues now facing Ireland is enormous, unprecedented housing crisis uh, with thousands of families and children made homeless, while at the same time we have, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in these sort of just absolutely extraordinary contradictions of the market system, while we have a quarter of a million empty houses uh, in the state, we have the worst homeless and housing housing crisis in the history of the state, rents going through the roof, courtesy of the vulture funds, who the state has sold off all this property that we paid for too, and are ratcheting up rents that have gone up uh, 20 to 30 percent in the last year, completely unaffordable uh, for people. And this crisis has been building up for the last five years, egged on obviously by the Troika uh, and so on. But in, in this week as well, the government finally, that had refused our demand and the popular demand to increase rent supplement to levels where at least there will be some chance that people on low incomes and social welfare might be able to pay rents and not be made homeless. As a result, the government finally this week capitulated and have introduced a 30% increase in rent supplement. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, that's not going to solve the crisis until we take this property back off the vulture funds and nationalise it and begin a major programme of council house construction, we are not going to solve the problem. Nonetheless, again, a fairly spectacular capitulation uh, by a government that has been preaching austerity, we can't afford it, there's nothing we can do, we're sorry, uh, and so on for the last, uh, for the last, uh, five, uh, for the last uh, five years. So we are starting to win things uh, because the people have risen up and confidence has risen and people are beginning to understand that people power works. And it helps in that regard to have a voice in the Parliament that uh, can give voice to those movements, to encourage them, to facilitate them and organise them uh, at a national level. Uh, people would be glad to know, I think Kieran Allen, our National Secretary, reported to me, we now have 45 branches of people before profit in Ireland, uh, across the country, including in... Uh, in rural areas like Cavan, I was speaking at a meeting in Cavan, which is you know, a very rural area that would not have any history of association with the radical left. In Donegal, in uh, Sligo, Roscommon, Kerry, uh, Wexford, and you can go on uh, through the list. So this is a remarkable, remarkable uh, breakthrough for the radical left, and we are in a very, very favourable favorable position. So that is, if you like, all of the good news. Uh, but I mean, I have to say that uh, it's important not to get carried away with all that. That is a very, very good position to be in. But I think, essentially, uh, the, the establishment strategy now is to wait us out uh, and wait for us to make a political mistake or to try and get at us in some way to undermine the momentum and the level of confidence that is building up in the working class uh, at, at the moment. I don't think they feel confident to face us down right now, uh, but are they going to come for us again? Absolutely. Uh, I think they very much hoped to wrong foot us on the exit, uh, campaign, but I think we, we, we did very well in how we conducted ourselves, but there's no doubt uh, probably if there was a referendum in Ireland, you'd probably get a majority would say remain. The, the working class would vote to exit, uh, or at least the manual working class would vote to exit. It would be very, very divided in the white-collar working class and the rich would vote to, to, to stay in Europe. Uh, so they... they uh, but they didn't wrong foot us uh, on it because we stood and took a principled stand. I have to say, in contrast to what Jeremy Corbyn did, as much as I hope he defeats, uh, defeats this attack by uh, the Blairites, I mean, it would have been very tempting for us not to say what we thought in certain areas where we have electoral representation which would be pro-Remain. Uh, but in truth, you have to come out and tell the truth to people, what you think is the truth, that the European Union is not part of the solution, it is a major part, if not the major part, uh, of uh, the problem. And funny enough, and it's a bit of advice for Jeremy Corbyn as well, when you actually tell the truth, 
even if it's unpopular with some of your supporters, people respect you for doing it. And you actually open up the debate uh, with, uh, with them. Uh, so I, I think this is the, uh, uh, you know, to bring it to a, a conclusion, I think the, the, the key to our success has been uh, our focus on the resistance from below, the mass movements, the social movements. I haven't even mentioned the successful battle to get marriage equality, uh, LGBT uh, marriage equality. We are almost certainly going to win the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and uh, have uh, abortion rights introduced in the country in the next year. And all of these battles were not always popular when they started. But we went out and, and won the argument at a grassroots level in working class communities and essentially have set out to hegemonize four radical and socialist and revolutionary ideas in working class areas. Uh, and uh, through a lot of hard work and organization, so that, if you like, many of these areas, like Breed's area where she elected, are literally fortresses for the left and working class, uh, uh, working class uh, resistance. Uh, so uh, this is you know, a very, very optimistic uh, scenario, but if you lose sight of, if you like, what is the strength that has brought you to this point, what is the force that is actually uh, making these people back down, it is not Breed or mine or Gino's articulacy in the Dáil er in Dáil Éireann. You know, as Varoufakis rightly put it when he went in and no doubt made a very cogent argument to the Troika about the need for debt relief to Greece and he reported that he might as well have been uh, humming the Swedish national anthem, I can tell you that's exactly uh, the look on the faces of uh, the political establishment in Dáil Éireann, no matter how articulate or well argued our speeches are. But their attitude their demeanour and the look in their face and the response to us is very, very different when they think there is a mass movement on the streets or that such a movement uh, might explode. So that's the lesson, comrades. Keep, keep your eye on the prize. Uh, don't, uh, don't compromise for what you might think be, sh be short-term political gain or popularity. Maintain your socialist principles and understand the key to bringing about change is the organized working class and a mass movement of ordinary people. Hi, folks. Um, I'm Ed Harper from... Well, uh, SWP in Ireland and the West Court branch people before profit. Um, it's, it's a very interesting time in Ireland, maybe even more interesting than it is here. But I think we're going to have to face our own um, referendum on Europe because I don't see, however much the current government would like to wait, I don't see the EU allowing them to, us to get away with the abolition of water charges because they, the EU made this such a crucial thing. They, they effectively had one or two major, major things they wanted when they came in. I mean, I, I don't know whether you're aware of it. You're probably not over here because, I mean, I, I'm English. You'll probably tell by the accent. And I know very well in England, Ireland, it's, funnily enough, people never look west. Um, but in actual fact, we'll change that, though. <laughs> anyway... But the, the fact of the matter is that the, the two things they most wanted were the property tax, and they got that, and the water charges, and they'll be very frustrated they didn't get that. And if they're talking about suing us, um, i.e. the Irish people, they can't sue the Irish people as such. What they'll do is they'll sue the Irish government, and then the Irish government will come for us in taxation, one way or another, to get this money for water charges. The, we've fought the water meters, but sadly there are a lot of water meters already in place, which gives them the physical infrastructure to start charging by the litre, which is obviously what we're, we're entirely opposed to. And when it comes down to it, in the last analysis, maybe not immediately, and maybe not over this one thing, it's going to come down to, well, OK, um, if Europe insists on this, and if we, our right-wing governments will not fight back about it, which they won't because they approve of it, then what do we do? 
And the answer will have to be, we leave Europe. Because Europe is a bosses club, and there is absolutely no way that they can afford to lose somebody else. They crushed the Greeks. They thought they could persuade the, the English, or the, should we say the British. They failed to persuade the Scots. And I think they think they can persuade the Irish at the moment because they did it before. We were very good boys at the beginning. But if we won't be persuaded, we're small, they'll try and crush us, and we're going to have to fight it. And I just hope to God we can. The longer it takes before they start doing that, the better position we'll be in, and we have to build now. And that is the message, that we really have to keep pushing it, and we really have to get the news out to people all over the country that this is coming. This is definitely coming sooner or later. They haven't gone away. Keep the boycott on and keep the, the organisation going, keep the networks going. And even in, in rural West Cork, there is massive opposition to water charges. And I don't see that we will not be able to fight this one and win. But I think it will mean leaving Europe. And I think we should consider doing that now. We should have our plans laid before they come for us. Thanks. Uh, I've just got a question about uh, United Ireland. Uh, I did hear the words United Ireland uh, actually mentioned uh, in the political discussions, and uh, obviously this is something that we're uh, all in favour of, but it was coming from a position of those who were for Remain in Europe, saying that the Northern Ireland majority was for Remain, and therefore if the North of Ireland was to join with the South, inside the European Union we could have a future United Ireland. Obviously that's not the vision that, uh, that, that our tradition would want. We want a, a workers' republic. But I've also spoken to people uh, in Manchester where I'm from who, 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 who living in, in, in Manchester but from Ireland who, say, who would seriously worried, but w will the troubles come back? Will this bring about more sectarianism? And also, will they send border? Will the border become you know, uh, a border to stop migrants coming in to the south, going into the north, and then coming in to Britain. Obviously, we'd say they're welcome here, but I, I wanted to know what, what yourselves, uh, what, how that is going to come about, what, what sort of arguments we put. Uh, so what about the prospects of a, a united island, and how do we argue that uh, in this new situation? Well, comrades, what better way to celebrate the centenary of the Irish Revolution uh, other than to salute the, uh, the, the, salute the election of revolutionaries to the Doyle in the south uh, and to the Assembly in, in the north. And uh, although I, I agree with uh, what Richard and Breed said about uh, many uh, of their opponents in the Doyle and the Assembly uh, being deaf uh, to their speeches. Uh, they certainly don't show it by the looks on their faces and they also inspire, they inspire revolutionaries throughout Europe because their message goes far beyond the Doyle and the Assembly. I've got two substantive points to make. The first one, a confession. Not a Catholic confession, but a political confession. I've got a relative who works for Goldman Sachs. Uh, Richard talked about the housing situation. This is a horror story. He was told to go over to Ireland and buy 27,000 houses uh, of the unfinished houses that, that Richard was talking about. He took a minivan over with his uh, cronies, toured the country, looked at all the houses, uh, looked at the areas they were in, went back to Goldman Sachs and says, we can buy these for nothing, but we're not going to do it because we'd have to sell them for less than nothing. The obscenity of empty houses in a country where people are homeless in the cities is outrageous and it's brilliant that our comrades have drawn attention to that. Second point is this. Sinn Féin was mentioned. We have to be absolutely clear what has happened here. That Sinn Féin has made a transition from militant republicanism to bourgeois nationalism and in the process is not afraid to use the techniques of the old Stalinist school of falsification when they're challenged by real revolutionary socialists. This week, for example, in Anthoblok, our comrades are being abused uh, by the Shinners. They're being uh, slandered and lies told about our politics, even to the extent that they say we don't believe in the 32-county uh, socialist uh, republic. And, and the reason for this is very, very interesting. 
The reason for this is particularly in West Belfast and in Derry, but also in the South as well, they have been exposed, that they have been challenged and challenged successfully. That in the North, they're imposing an austerity uh, uh, agreement and part uh, of an austerity government in collusion with, obviously, the reactionary DUP. But in the South, as Bree said, it is absolutely true that whenever uh, they have made a commitment to the struggle that has taken place, they have to be pushed and pushed and pushed in order to make sure that they hold to that commitment and they have always tried to shift their position for their own electoral gain. And I think it's absolutely vital that we celebrate, and I'll, I'll put no, make no bones about saying this, we, that we celebrate the exposure uh, of up. nationalist politics uh, and uh, celebrate instead uh, the, the triumph, uh, albeit uh, temporary and albeit uh, not in, 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 in more general terms, but celebrate the triumph of our comrades in the campaign, in the movement, uh, and the representation that they've achieved in both the Doyle and the Assembly. Um, just a few more comments on the question of a united Ireland. Um, in response to what happened of, of the Brexit vote and so on and the way the, the North uh, voted for Remain, what Sinn Féin did is said they would propose a border poll, a poll on whether people wanted the border between North and South uh, to, to remain. And we have made, and Breed made a video about it and so on, absolutely clear that if uh, in such a border poll, uh, we will vote for Irish unity. Right, that border, we would vote yes or whatever the, the question is in, in a border poll. Okay, fine. That, of course, is a question of principle. But let's also be clear, though, that this is actually not going to happen. There may, you know, there isn't, this is not how Irish unity is really going to come about. And I think that w the point is that the election, North and South of people before profit representatives, enables us to pose the question of actually winning a United Ireland in a new way. Of course, the Socialist Workers' Party in Ireland has always stood, as much of the left has it in Ireland, for a 32-county workers' republic, you know, the position of Connolly. But for years, this was just an abstract slogan. Of course, we are for a 32-county socialist republic, you know, you, you, with no, not really being able to make this a living reality, either in the North or, or the South. But what we see now is a situation where we can pose this question in a new way, because we can say that there is a movement in the North and a movement in the South that is fighting austerity. We're fighting austerity in the, the North, we're fighting austerity in the South. Let's unite these struggles. And not just that, we can also say we are fighting for uh, uh, LGBT rights, North and South. Let's unite those struggles. We can say we're fighting for a woman's right to choose. North and South, let's unite those struggles. We can say we're fighting racism and to welcome refugees. North and South, let's uni uh, uh, unite those struggles. We are fighting about housing. North and South, let's unite those struggles. On all these kind of issues, a whole range of issues, there is a real movement and a real constituency that we can relate to. North and South that stand for the same principles against both the reactionary state against the reactionary northern state and the reactionary southern state that both came out of the carnival reaction following partition. In other words, this makes a reality. I don't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but it is the way of making a concrete reality of the idea that it is the Irish working class that are the real inheritors of the struggle for Irish freedom and Irish unity. That's how we can pose the question of uniting Ireland in reality, not just as a slogan in the years to come. After the next speaker, it will be the comrade, I think about three rows back. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, very, very briefly, um, it was magic to actually see uh, Richard Boyd Barrett being elected last time round. Uh, and this time round, we now, has, as you've heard our speakers tell you, with Breed joining him uh, and so forth, and, and Eamon and Jerry up in the north. Uh, Going back to the days in the, in the mid-70s in IS, to, to go back to a, a distant time, um, the thought that we would actually get 
either an MP or TDs elected was a dream, you know. Uh, not for adulation, but it meant to propaganda purposes. We have got that far. And for some of us like myself and my partner, who are not as mobile as we'd like to be, we can't do as much as we wish for. But all I would say is, is congratulations, we've got one step further forward because the propaganda is important. If you want to build people on the streets, you need to have the propaganda message. Thank you. <coughs> So, uh, viewing all of this through the internet only, as you can tell by my accent, um, I'm curious about where the growth in, uh, in the left has happened, where, is, where it's come from demographically, and whether there's been a lot of continuity between groups like the Workers' Party, um, or also, you know, just from, um, from other left Republicans in general, and also from defectors from labor, of which you guys have obviously rightfully massacred them in Dublin, um, and how that's affected the latter, how that's affected your relationship with groups like the Luas drivers and other trade unionists who are rank and filers who have been completely and rightfully disgusted with labor. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the victory of the uh, far left TDs in Ireland is something that a lot of people across the world have been looking to. And uh, for example, the statement that you recently issued in relation to the EU was very important because the EU, I come from Africa, the EU has provided a platform for different sections of European capital probably to punch above their weight. So you find a situation of absolutely horrifying electricity privatization going on in Ghana and one of the lead companies wanting to take over and do all the things that uh, you, you, you've described in the water charges in the case of electricity in Ghana, the ESB, for example, being, being a, 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 a one of those. We also take the, 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 the sense from what the, what the EU has done in transforming different aspects of Ireland itself. The fact that Ireland joined the EU required Ireland to become a bit more exclusive, close its borders more tightly, become more racist in that respect in terms of immigration and, and, and uh, you know, uh, discriminating against different people uh, uh, on, on, on that basis. So I think it's a great thing in many respects. I just wanted to mention these two things. But I have a couple of questions. I, I understand perfectly the emphasis that Breed and Richard have given to the role of the organized working class and to mass uh, movements and using phrases like people power and so on and so forth. Absolutely correct. We need to be looking outward and that's actually ultimately our aim about mobilizing the whole class being self, self-mobilized. But I want to ask a question about the role of the SWP within this. I think it's a critical thing that, because for example, when we talk in terms of 1916 and James Connolly and so on and so forth, we also understand your own uh, 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 party and your own uh, uh, work has made us understand even better the tragedy of, of, of uh, Connolly not having a revolutionary party of his own to be able to intervene in that broader nationalist movement uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that it's really important to be able to understand that the role that the, the party plays and the relationship that it has in relation to, 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 uh, to uh, um, some of the things that uh, you've, you, you, you've described. That's my, the, the fundamental question that I, I wanted to ask. Thank you. Hi, I'm originally from Derry, but I'm living in Edinburgh now. But I had the privilege of going back for three days to Doorknock for Jerry Carroll in Belfast in between visiting my mother. And uh, it was a joy to do. And it, usually when you, you're in exile and you live over here, you hear Stormont and you think, right, what fucking lunatic has just said something now? <laughs> and you're usually just waiting for some kind of carnival of reaction or sh- bullshit, to be honest. And But now you see socialists in and to see it's like a politics of hope is a breath of breath of fresh air it's absolutely something different to go around the, in west belfast like the heartland of Sinn Féin I mean, where they've had a grip and see jerry's progress and see what they've been able to break through is it you know it gives you the hope that you actually can do this you can cut through the shit you can actually make a difference and our politics cut through some of the most entrenched sectarian politics you'll ever see and it makes such a difference. And we can learn a hell of a lot from the way they do it. The grassroots building, I think, of what they've done in Ireland, going onto the estates, doing this work, it's actually, it's an ABC. 
And we should be no going and asking them, here, what's the basics? What did you actually start off with? Because that's more important and it, it's definitely something we can learn from. So, yeah, it's the politics of hope and it's an absolute joy to see. And we should know this is a celebration, I think, really what's happened in the last year. Thank you. It's a bit short for this. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about Richard when he told, uh, told, spoke to us that there was a meeting of 50 people on the Falls Road. Now, those of us who've been involved in Irish politics, the idea that we could go to the Falls Road, speak at a meeting like that, is an absolute sea change in Irish politics for us. I think it's really, really important to celebrate that. And the speaker who came up and asked what the role of the party would be in that, I think it's precisely that. Uh, I think it's also uh, interesting the way that Richard characterised the, the fight over austerity as uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, bosses, if you like, making a tactical retreat. Now, it's very interesting. They've done that before. Around the poll tax, you will, those of you who are around there will remember, the poll tax wasn't introduced into Northern Ireland because if that debate had happened where the Falls and the Shankill could have a joint meeting about non-payment, it would have been a, a problem for the ruling class. And I think that's what's so important about this, is that the fight is both connecting with the movement, uh, being a fulcrum that can move the disaffection forward and fight it, but also being aware of the history of the past, what it means, and the tactical decisions that have been made. This has been one of the most exciting meetings for me, because I've been around the struggle in Ireland for a long time. This is... It's, it's there are historic changes taking place, but the key is to keep our eye on what actually the general motor of it is. It's not enough just simply to celebrate, of course, which we do, uh, movements like People Before Profit and so on, but also to see ourselves as a fulcrum for moving that struggle forward. After our next speaker, it'll be the speaker at the back. Yeah, it might have been a, a slip of the tongue with the last speaker, but just to correct it, the, the actual the meeting was on the Shankill Road, which is, yeah, because the Falls Road, people may be aware, is a, you know, a Catholic nationalist area, handy enough to get a meeting there. But actually, to get them on the Shankill, and it wasn't just that there was a meeting of 50 people. Our comrades went, this is after the election, they went door to door to five, with 500 leaflets, and ask people to come to that meeting. And that's a brave thing to do. But it's in that atmosphere that they were able to do it. And, you know, hats off to them. Um, the other thing I want to say, though, is to underscore the importance of the water charges movement, because that brought, that made the term people power a reality in Ireland. And it was out of that sense, that understanding that people got of people power, that our electoral success came. Um, it, it, it actually, you know, it not only did it, did, did it bring in the electoral success, which in turn reinforces, you know, the sense of people power that we can get our own ones in there and that they can speak up for us. And, and there's great stuff happening too as a consequence of that, just in the way people use social media. Uh, I hate social media myself, uh, <laughs> just the wrong generation, but I, I know the power of it, uh, respect the power of it. And, and the, the thing that was referred to earlier of how, I think as Sean said, of how the um, Sinn Féin tried to rubbish... Uh, our stand on the uh, on the border, you know, that we weren't for a 32 county republic. Bree did a little a little video clip. It had something like 10,000 hits with it in less than a day. You know that people are listening now to what we have to say about stuff that goes beyond just the water charges but also takes it into that whole area of, uh, of <coughs> Irish unity and the way, the way clips on, on the contributions that both Richard and, uh, and Breed uh, and, and Gino, our other uh, TD, the contributions that they uh, are their, you know, question speeches in the doll, they may be to the board, you know, sort of, or the, the, the absent uh, opposition, uh, or rather the government, but actually it's the importance of those clips going around among the people that are sharing them. It's amazing. You know, I, I never realised so many people watch the bloody Oireachtas reports. It's fantastic because they are now, our gang are in their talk and they love it. Um, but the, yeah, sorry, just to go back to the water, the water charges movement, though, and the confidence that gave the class, and the way it has, 
it has lifted not only uh, not only their, their their confidence in their own potential power and belief in people power, but stuff like the uh, the marriage equality referendum. Uh, you know that was generally thought of as being and would have been previously, I think, uh, hived off into that kind of Please liberal middle class area. Actually, the highest votes for marriage equality were in the working class areas. Ninety percent, you know, over ninety percent. In the, uh, in the area that Breed is from, massive numbers of people coming out to campaign for something in Holy Catholic Ireland. So the bishops are sick, the bosses are sick, and it's brilliant. The last uh, contribution will be our last contribution. I'm really sorry if anyone indicated I couldn't call you. Um, yeah. Uh, congratulations to the deputies. Uh, I once remember standing in a courtyard throwing two pence coins at a number of other politicians yeah, yeah, yeah. a very long time ago. Little, at that, little at that point did we think that... that, 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 that <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Um, the, the turnaround in that is remarkable, and it shouldn't be forgotten, so I'm now about to forget it and talk about something else. Because um, I actually want to talk about an English problem. Um, and what that is, is that today I went on, for my job as socialist worker, I went on the Re- Remain demo. And a very nice person of the many people I talked to. Some of them were a bit strange. Some of them were very nice. One of them said, but we'll lose Northern Ireland now. <laughs> and I thought, how do I break it to them? <laughs> Both that that isn't how we're going to lose Northern Ireland and of course that would be a damn fine thing (laughs) and this is what I think is worth us pausing for a minute what I think is right for us to think of the English problem both congratulations for their fight against austerity but we also have to up our fight against austerity but also as a local closer to home Theresa Villiers is a particularly unpleasant person. She's the Northern Ireland Secretary. She spends most of her time responding to inquiries at the minute. Most of those inquiries are about collusion, where British forces armed and involved in the murder of people. Those things have been covered up for very long. Gradually, as time passes, bits and pieces drip out. Lock in Ireland's massacre recently came to the forefront. The response of the British government is always, oh, oh, nothing to do with us, Gov. But it was to do with them. And I think it's important. It's also the case that it has disappeared from Labour Party politics. A man called David Anderson, who comes from the northeast of England, is now the shadow secretary for Northern Ireland. I'm not sure he knows where Northern Ireland is, to be honest. And I think it's therefore important on ours. It is the austerity that Britain is bringing that is imposed in Northern Ireland. It is the repression that Britain brought in the past that is still not atoned for or even admitted in many circumstances. I say that because next week, when Chilcot comes out, there'll be a very small chapter down the bottom end that no one will really read, except me probably, about, about how the people who ran the secret operations in Iraq after the invasion were run by the same people who ran death squads in Northern Ireland. The lessons that created the sectarianism in Iraq were created with the British at their very best. Those links are still there. Those arguments are still there. The fact that our side has been able to turn some of the tide of that is a hugely impressive thing. We shouldn't underestimate it for a minute. But as well as congratulating the great work that the comrades are doing in North and South, we also need to up our own game, both against austerity, but also against what used to be described as British misrule in Ireland. back directly on the last speaker. It's a very important point Simon raises and it's very interesting that you do raise it Simon because I've been asked um, by various uh, you know justice for the forgotten committees to partake in a committee called justice for the forgotten in the Doyle and it stems from the Dublin Monaghan bombings in 1974. 42 years later we're still trying to extract the information from the British government that will tell us Uh, what role was played by the British state in the biggest incident of uh, murder in the whole of the Troubles, which was the bombing of Dublin, carried out by and colluded by uh, undercover British forces. And uh, we had the debate in the Dáil, and I was amazed listening to one after the other of the Sinn Féiners, from Mary Lou to Gerry Adams to Sean Crow, 
Uh, and their contributions were very refined down to the sort of suffering of the families and the 42 years of pain and grief and they need closure and all of that is very true. But they did not get angry like Simon just did or like I did after them about the role of the British state in maintaining uh, uh, you know, the sectarianism and the murder and the collusion that happened over the 30-year period of, the, of, as they call it, the Troubles. There was no sense of outrage by... By the, 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 the sort of the, the leaders of, of the nationalist cause, and that really surprised me. So I'm looking forward to seeing how we get on on this committee. But I do think it's important that just like Chilcot next week, those fissures are opened up, and the role of Britain in 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 uh, in, in, that, in the war in Northern Ireland and the collusion of MI5 and the SAS and all the rest of it is blown apart because they did deepen and drive the sectarian division between orange and green uh, by, by their actions for a long, a long, long period of time and are directly responsible, therefore, for the murder of many thousands of people. Um, so the, the one thing I did forget to mention in, in my... Uh, in, in my introduction was the question of abortion rights and it's hugely important today in Belfast there's um, a march for abortion rights that buses, bus loads from Wexford, Cork and Dublin have gone up to participate in. That's a really 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 important step forward a young woman in Belfast a couple of months ago got a sentence for taking the abortion pill and the abortion pill is an issue for young women now, it wasn't in my day but it, 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 there's still 12 women a day get on the boat to go to Britain for abortion and then probably more to other countries like Holland and Spain. And in Northern Ireland, the 67 Act was never applied to Northern Ireland. So this throws open the whole question of the bigots who have controlled the hearts and minds of those states and still control the political apparatus and the health services of both states. So when we begin to fight uh, on a cross-border basis for abortion rights, we are challenging the bigots of the Catholic Church and the bigots of the, of the fundamentalist uh, Protestant churches in the north because both will try to come down on us like a ton of bricks. And I think it's really important that we're having that you know, cooperation between north and south on the question of, of abortion rights. We have a, a bill going before the doll. We just moved it the other day in the autumn. We have 100 days. This is the way we're putting it to people. We have 100 days to campaign to put every bit of pressure we can on every party and every individual in the Irish government to repeal that horrible Eighth Amendment that was brought in in the dark days of the 80s when Anne Lovett died in the churchyard and given birth and the Kerry Babies trial happened and all of those awful, awful things. The Catholic Church does not have sway on the young women or the young men of today. And if they get to vote on this, we will drive abortion rights onto the top of the agenda for Irish women for the first time ever. Um, a comrade asked about the growth on the left for, for us on the left and did it uh, t uh, encapsulate sort of former workers party, disaffected Labour Party members and all the rest of it. There might be the odd one in the ranks of people before profit, but to be honest, that's not the way it happened. I would say there's quite more than an odd one of them voted for us. Like there was always a workers party candidate in Ballyferm, it used to get about 300 votes. I probably, they didn't ran, run the last time, I probably got every, every single one, in fact I know I got every single one of those votes. It's not like they the ex-Stalinist Labour types are, are, are running into our ranks. What we're getting is, is, is people for the first time involved in politics, brand new to politics through the water movement, brand new to politics through fighting housing and through fighting austerity. And what we're also getting, and I have to say the Socialist Party, our allies, are not getting anything like it. We're getting a huge reach. Richard mentioned it. We were in Cavan. Bally Shannon, I was in Mayo last week and then uh, in Balbriggan and Richard was in Cavan and then in Wexford. We're, we're really touching a, 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 you know, a, a nerve in rural Ireland and uh, in all the towns and cities around. So it is growing and it is very, very interesting. The comrades in the north, I went to Jerry Carroll's election victory and on the night, 200 people left uh, membership forms to join people before profit. So they are going to not mushroom, but sprout uh, over the next period in terms of the, the amount of branches they're going to be able to build. So it's very important and very interesting. Just um, uh, one of the things that somebody else asked about was the role of the SWP. And again, very crucial. And we have these debates among ourselves. The SWP 
began the whole idea of people before profit. We talked after uh, the anti-war movement and the anti charge movement way back in the, seems like way back in 2005, 2006. We talked to a lot of different groups we were involved in. We said, do you think, don't you think we need a, a party that gives electoral expression and a vehicle to people in all these campaigns that goes beyond Sinn Féin and goes beyond the Labour Party who are, who, who are not up to the, stepping up to the plate. And we got various groups on board. We launched People Before Profit. We engaged in various campaigns. We, we brought out policy documents. We fought on issues. We ran in the elections. And really, it was the, the, the question of... Um, the question of um, water charges that catapulted us into into position. But it's been different and slightly different in some cases. So if you take Jerry Carroll, for example, before he ever was, became a councillor, what catapulted him into a position of strength among young people in particular was the question of Palestine. Because people before Prophet and Belfast got out in the streets when the attack was happening on Gaza and they attracted a huge amount of young people and political people who didn't have a home inside the Republican movement or inside loyalism and became you know, members of people before Prophet but they were the heart and soul of the campaign and teams uh, for Jerry's elections. So, the, and I, I should mention, because he hardly gets a mention, Gino Kenny, when he got elected in one of the poorest, hardest areas of Dublin, was lifted up on the shoulders of all his comrades, waving the Palestinian flag. And the video of him doing that went viral in the Middle East in no time. So those things are very, very important. Um, I I just want to finish on on what I think might be, uh, what I know is a big challenge. We've discussed it at our conference and we've got a real focus on it. And that is the question of the the organised working class. We have just seen a magnificent strike by the drivers of the trams in Dublin. They were the most vilified, the most um, torn apart, the most criticised, the most terrorised group of workers I have ever seen by the media, by the political establishment, by the other trade unions and by their own union to a large degree. But they stuck it out through thick and thin and they have secured an 18% pay increase. Absolutely amazing and breakthrough. And it, it's not only just the pay increase they got. Now, they did go in looking for 50% in fairness. To them. <laughs> so they're a little bit disappointed. <laughs> um, but it's not just about the pay increase they got. It's also the fact that they defended new entrants against a yellow pack grade that would push young workers and new workers right down into a position of uh, poverty and not being able to afford to... Um, and not being able to afford to rent an apartment in Dublin. And this is an issue that is coming back to bite the government in the bum. Teachers, nurses, Gardaí, no, I'm no lover of the Gardaí, but nevertheless an important conundrum for the state. Teachers, nurses, Gardaí, public sector workers, all had their pay levels dropped to the floor for, the, for purposes of bailing out the banks. They're all now looking at the success of the Lewis drivers, and they are now saying it's payback time for workers. So the day we left, the teachers are outside the dial, as were the guards at different times, thankfully. And the, when we go back, these national school teachers, just like the NUT here next week, are planning strike action to get pay equality, because young teachers, in their lifetime, if you start a teacher in Dublin after 2011, you will earn in your career a quarter of a million euro less than the colleague that's working next to you. It's an absolute scandal but it's a point that I think we're, we've, we, we're, we have to catch up on very much in terms of our uh, sinking roots in the industrial area. We've done this with a small conference there recently. We're having another big one in, um, in the autumn but it's really important to recognise that now is a, they say never waste a good crisis and we're saying never waste a good, good recovery. It's now payback time for, wor- for workers. The the private sector through the Lewis drivers have opened it up and now we have to get into that gap and have a real row with every section of the working class to demand our slice of the cake. Thank you, Breed. And um, Richard Boyd Barrett. Yeah, there was a couple of there was a couple of uh, very specific questions. One about the border and all that. Um, what's the story with the border? Well, I mean, here you have an interesting uh, conundrum in the aftermath of the exit vote because, of course, the Remain people uh, were saying, and their supporters in Ireland, were saying, oh, an exit vote would be a disaster because uh, it will lead to uh, the re-establishment of the border, north and south. 
uh, and tariffs and various other control, passport controls and all, all the rest of it. Uh, now, interestingly, nobody, even the uh, the uh, you know vile right in the form of Farage and uh, Johnson, all the rest of it, or the Irish establishment, or any part of Irish society, have all said they don't want that to happen because, and for different reasons. But basically, it makes no sense. There's always been a common travel area between Ireland and Britain. Uh, we're uh, you know we're massive trading partners and all the rest of it. So it makes no sense. For anybody in Britain or Ireland, no matter where they are in the political uh, spectrum, to have the re-establishment of border controls. But who is going to demand border controls? The European Union. The European Union will demand it. Uh, because that is front, frontier Europe, uh, fortress Europe, and this is already coming into play. So even though the Irish, uh, the Irish government uh, uh, argued for uh, remain, now they are in a fight uh, and have already started to say to Europe, well, we, need a, we, need a, we, need a, we have a special relationship with Britain, and the initial signals from uh, Europe is, sorry, tough luck. Uh, you know, so anybody who has illusions in the sort of progressive nature of the European Union on the issue of uh, border controls needs their head examined. They are the ones who are pushing for this stuff. Uh, that's not in any way to uh, gloss over the hideous racism uh, and xenophobia of Farage and so on. But the fact is, if a border is re-established, it will be courtesy of the European Union. Um, uh, but also just on the sort of, you know, the, the partitionism and all that kind of thing. I mean, you know, to be honest, we are the only people who are now consistent in terms of having a project for unity. I mean, you have, you know, I mean, to me, unity means you believe that the interests of ordinary people north and south of the border are common interests uh, and that you should fight for those common interests. Uh, what is the Sinn Féin position? The Sinn Féin position is uh, to have different positions north, on north and south. Different positions on the European Union. So in the north, uh, they were for Remain. Uh, but in the south, they're constantly criticizing the European Union, but telling people in the north, actually, the way we'll get a united Ireland is through the European Union. Are they completely bonkers? Right? That uh, now, the European Union, it, rather than the struggle of ordinary people in Ireland, is the method through which we are going to uh, unite north and south. It's crazy stuff. Uh, in the north, they have embraced uh, a shocking agreement. I don't know if people are familiar with the, the Stormont House Agreement. And it's the reason why Jerry Carroll topped the poll in Jerry Adams's home constituency. Topped the poll. Uh, far, uh, 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 far ahead of any of the Sinn Féin candidates. Why? Because Sinn Féin have signed up to a deal which has committed to privatise a whole raft of state uh, assets and state services in the North, has agreed to cut 10% of the public sector uh, workforce uh, in the North, uh, and a whole rake of other uh, cuts in the areas of public spending. Sinn Féin have done this, but in the South... They're anti-austerity. They're the leaders of anti-austerity, according to themselves, although if they think they might lose a few votes from it, they wobble then suddenly. Uh, and suddenly they're not the leaders of austerity. And then they are again, and then they're not. Right? This is the sort of carry-on uh, that is going on. So our vision of how you achieve a united Ireland uh, is precisely by relying on the people who can be relied upon uh, to fight borders and to fight uh, for real unity, which is the working class people north and south who have common interests in fighting, as has been said, not just austerity, but fighting for abortion rights, which, by the way, Jerry Adams uh, can't say enough that he's pro-life. He's pro-life, that's what he says, to make concessions to the backward Catholic right in the north. He's for some limited opening up of the abortion laws because he has to pander a little bit to the overwhelming majority in the south who want change on this, but let's not go too far. That's the Sinn Féin position. It's flipping outrageous. Right, so we are the people who are consistent fighting for women's rights, uh, fighting for women's rights, uh, uh, fighting austerity, fighting against racism, or, or uh, whatever. Um, and... Uh, uh, just on the party, and I mean, one thing flows from the other, the role of the SWP in all of this. 
Uh, and just to tell comrades, because uh, somebody asked me, is there a danger the SWP will liquidate into people before profit? And I want to tell you absolutely, uh, we are committed that will not happen, and it is not happening. Of course, there are pressures, because we are, uh, if you like, Socialist Workers' Party is a component part of people before profit, but we are also in leading positions uh, within people before profit at every level. But when I said that people for profit have expanded to 45 uh, branches around the country, I mean, when I joined the SWP in, whenever it was, too long ago, to, it's shocking to even think about it, uh, 1989 or something, we had one branch in Dublin and one branch in Cork of the SWP, and there were small branches, right? So there's been a massive expansion. But in all of those areas where we are recruiting significant numbers of people to pe people for profit, in every single area, we we're recruiting people to the SWP. And there's a very, you know, everybody knows in People Before Profit that we're SWP. When we do People Before Profit stalls, we have socialist worker on those stalls. There's no problem. That's fine. You're the socialist worker part of this wider thing, which is People Before Profit. And People Before Profit's membership is uh, much bigger. Uh, its overall support base is, if you like, uh, much uh, broader than just uh, the revolutionary politics of the SWP. But we don't have no real tension within the organization about the existence and the centrality uh, of the SWP because it's a very open, grassroots, democratic, people power based uh, 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 organization. But where, and I'll just conclude on this, where is the role of the SWP on this? It is precisely to be the people who come in with the clear politics when difficult questions uh, 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 confront this broad movement, like precisely like what should be our attitude on r remain or exit. Uh, is to have the clear politics that can come in and win out those arguments. Or if people say, oh, Jesus, maybe we shouldn't take up the issue of, uh, uh, of refugees' rights in the direct vision centres because that's not very popular and you might lose a few votes, right? And, of course, those tensions exist in an organisation that is trying to uh, win elections. But we have to be the people who come in and say, absolutely no way. We have to stand on principle on this issue and fight absolutely unequivocally and unconditionally for refugees' rights uh, against... Uh, racism and xenophobia, not be silent on it, but be loud and clear. Uh, and as Breed said, critically, one of the arguments that we now have to inject into a movement that was largely a community-based movement and a social movement around social issues and the water charges and bin charges is the central centrality of the organised working class. When Breed said the Lewis workers were vilified, you, it was just shocking Right? And that put pressure on some of our support to say, Jesus, don't support the Lewis workers, for God's sake. It's totally unpopular. And the, the narrative was, these are greedy bastards, don't support them. Uh, it's not a progressive cause. And we had to stand up and say, absolutely not. These workers are being vilified because actually, if they win, it'll be a victory for every worker in the country. And you have to stand on principle. That's why you need revolutionary politics. <laughs>